So as he, Exar, represented the only mission in space where three radar frequencies were flown, X-band, C-band and L-band, ever since. This is, these are the only missions in April and October 1994 where data sets were acquired simultaneously in these three frequencies. So this is a treasure case by itself. But during the second uh, space shuttle mission in October 1994, it was decided to perform an experiment to fly the shuttle in a repeat pass orbit that would allow interferometric exploitation of the data acquired. The result was a great success. And it was shown that using X-band, C-band and L-band, how the interferometric quality varied depending with the wavelength. And it became feasible to think about a global mission with a C-band antenna or an X-band antenna to acquire a digital elevation model of our planet Earth in a very high geometric resolution. So the American National Imaging and Mapping Agency got interested and made a requirement. They asked for an elevation model with a height resolution of 15 meters and a geometric lateral resolution of 20 meters. To fulfill such a requirement, then they would pay the launch of a further shuttle mission. To fulfill this requirement, some technical considerations had to be fulfilled. And I would like to demonstrate this with my little cute furry space shuttle, what was planned. Here you see the space shuttle. This is the payload bay. The space shuttle is, th is about 30 meters in length. The payload bay is 18 meters in length. In this payload bay, there's a lid that opens and in there were the X-band, C-band and L-band radar antennas. Now for interferometry you need a second antenna. So these antennas were active antennas but to have a second one it would be sufficient to have just a passive antenna that acquires all the backscattered signals but from another viewing angle. So it was calculated if we deploy a boom that extends from the shuttle payload bay with 30 meters in length, the same size the shuttle has, 30 meters in length, deploy another antenna in 30 meters distance, well, this distance would have not been enough to resolve the data to a 15 meter height resolution elevation model. So just from the calculations, the engineering calculations, it became clear that not a 30 meter boom, a 60 meter boom, twice the length of the shuttle was needed to fulfill a baseline requirement to resolve the Earth's topography with 15 meter height resolution. So it took, as you can see, only six years between October 1994 and February 2000 when such a system was fulfilled and the shuttle radar topography mission flew. The German Aerospace Center as well as the Italian Space Agency were very lucky to be on board on this Circe EXA mission because now the radar X-band antennas that they had developed were already in the payload bay of the good shuttle endeavor. 
the fifth shuttle that had been built. Um, so you do not destroy such a system that has been proven in space. So DLR, the German Space Center, and RC, the uh, Italian Space Center, had the opportunity to fly, to get a free flight for the SRTM mission as well. So the X-band antennas having a smaller wavelength did not produce a global elevation model such as the NASA C-band antennas, but the concept was proven. And the German industry and the German um, Space Center got very much interested and convinced the German government to support in a public-private partnership the development of Terrasa X and Tandem X which is the state-of-the-art, the best interferometric system flying in space in a very exciting helix orbit to be able to use both satellites continuously for the construction of a global elevation model, which was finished last year. So now an elevation model globally is available on purchase, since it is based on a private-public partnership for everybody and for scientists, some restricted areas on our planet. So this was an example of X-Band. You see also other X-Band systems here developed by the Italian space industry and space agencies, Cosmos SkyMed, also allowing continuous monitoring of the land surfaces, or the Earth's surfaces rather. Well, we have other lines of frequency history. As you see these green bars indicating our European C-band history from 1991, ERS-1, 2, followed by Envisat, and now with the Sentinels. And I also brought one of the models of Sentinel-1, our radar satellites. So they are, again, it's the sa same system for Sentinel-1A and B. Here are the radar antennas, and these are the solar panels supplying the satellite with energy. So the interesting aspect about the C-band timeline is, of course, this is the longest, going back to 91, to explore changes on our planet's surface due to the calibrated radar signals that can be exploited. And on top, also repeat pass interferometry applying to satellites, not simultaneously, but in a repeat pass fashion. You see there's another green bar, which is the radar sat line, almost as long as the ERS-1 line. These are Canadian systems um, but they are commercial systems, so rather for ship tracking, ice monitoring um, issues that the Canadian government is concerned about. Last but not least, you see some blue bars. These are the L-band systems deployed by the Japanese Space Agency, starting with JERS-1 in the 90s. These data were free, so in the 90s we had some time where we had free data from ERS-1, 2 and JERS-1, C-band and L-band, but no X-band data. This L-band time series is continued by JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, through ALOS-1 and ALOS-2. But the data are now being sold, the system has been transformed to a commercial system. And this is the advantage of the Sentinels belonging to a public program where data are free. Different wavelength, but free data, higher geometric resolution and higher temporal repetition. So you may ask yourself, well, what happened to NASA? You see, there is a long gap since February 2000, when the SRTM mission has been flying. The emphasis of NASA has rather changed 
to multi-sensor systems based on optical systems and atmospheric remote sensing. Um, but now NASA is back on track, launching in the near future another L-band system called NISAR, which will actually work in combination with the Japanese ALOS. But also the German Aerospace Center is being interested to continue this very successful twin mission with another frequency called Tandem L. So the success based on this very special helix orbit for the TerraSax and Tandem X should be continued using an L-band system. So now you see, since the beginning of this millennium, we have all three frequencies in space that were once flown in 1994 and all these applications that have been proven or have been discovered with the data sets of the Circe Exa shuttle missions can now be transformed into reality and operational monitoring with the systems in space.